you talked about um, inheriting John's gear, and obviously you've got the fu- fuzz face there. Um, I assume you're talking about like when you joined the band and they, they had all John's kit sort of laying about. Here you go, this is your stuff type thing. <laughs> so you had these, yeah. you had these twins, you had two twins, didn't you? You had a Mark III yeah. Mesa Boogie, like you said. You got that fuzz face. No, I didn't have that. Oh. No, the Boogie wasn't there. Oh, we took yeah. that away. Okay. Um, yeah, and the cabs, Boogie cabs, if there were any, they they would come. Ah, uh, okay. As um, um, and because everything John had bought before the record deal, probably he kept because yeah. it was his buy. Yeah. you know? um purchase so like the hoffners and the stuff like that um right his gretch um all the guitars you know that jag jazz master jack guitar whatever you know modified one oh, there'd be yeah, other yeah. guitars like that they were his so they wouldn't have been coming yeah. to but the equipment that was bought through the record deal that, i mean this is my opinion i think everything that was bought with the record deal was a case of it belongs to the band are you going to keep it that means you don't get this money or whatever you know there'll be things like that probably yeah and what sort yeah. of um did because I, I heard you had like an echoplex delay did you did you like yeah play around I, i've got that here <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that, that's no, impressive <laughs> Yeah, it I, was a I heard, um, echo, does it does it yeah. does it uh does it color the sound any? Really? Because I heard uh, you know like him going through, loads. Yeah, yeah like because it's got a preamp part of it, hasn't it? So there are two parts to an echoplex really yeah. that are part of the tone. The main, one part is the preamp section, which you can buy as pedals. You can buy them from Jim Dunlop. We do a brilliant echoplex Gold. preamp. <laughs> yeah, and, and also. A company called Exotic Effects uh, from Japan that distributes through Europe and um, through US, Exotics US. Um, they do an EP booster. It's called the EP oh, yeah, booster, like a that. mini pedal, um, same size as these little pedals here, basically. Yeah. Um, called the EP booster, which is another one. We dip switches internally as well to set the sound. Again, same thing, Echoplex preamp, and there are other companies that do them too. Um, the other part is the fact that you're using a piece of electronics and mechanical device so motors the speed of the motors the wow the flutter the tape degradation all these factors play an important yeah, part of yeah. echoplexes uh, tonally so um the, but they're shifting they're very human like you can't predict what they do so you know strymon will try and well try they've done a great job of their d type delay on it that you know um the tape delay yeah. unit on a strymon timeline or the um El Capistan, it's called. And then again, Jim Dunlop do one, um, uh, uh, you know, tape delay, complex style, um, and do Castle and Bread. Um, uh, there are loads of companies, <coughs> basically, that do, yeah. you know, tape delays. But that's an important part of the sound, um, yeah. tape delay. And yeah. did you did you did you use that Echoplex on on stage, or was it too bit too? I did, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah, it's an amazing piece of kit. I used it on all of uh, Ian Brown's first album, second album. Oh. So on um, Unfinished Monkey Business, there's um, that Echoplex is all over it, yeah. especially on um, the B-side of my style, which was See the Dawn. Um, that's all Echoplex, oh. all the feedback and stuff. Yeah. Cool. Beautiful piece yeah. of kit. Um, and, um, but I also inherited the guitars as well. So I had the 1959 Gibson Les yeah, Paul. I was going to get <laughs> Yeah, I the blood red sunburst Les Paul standard, which you use for love spreads. Yeah, um, the tuning, and right? also the Gibson ES three four five nineteen fifty nine, which he this... used in the love spreads video when stood yeah. under the pylons. Yeah, the yeah. US video, isn't it? Is the sunburst one, isn't it? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. The the strats I inherited were the pink uh, Resurrection strat. Yeah. The there was a painted over 59 strat 1959 strat oh, right. um there was another what was that yeah it was big, those two really the 59 and there was that strat which was made from two uh stratocasters a 64 and a 62 or something like that Very body nice. and neck were different yeah and uh what was, um, what was the 59 like to, to play because <laughs> I was, I was the, there were, all of those guitars were just unbelievable they were yeah. mint you know i mean <laughs> i was just stoked you know receiving the guitars yeah. i mean me council estate boy could ever afford anything like these you know yeah, yeah. um and then i'm like in heaven <laughs> yeah sounds like being in heaven it's quite rough on um, the back of the neck is that right yeah 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 that's it's right didn't really yeah. affect playing though it's still beautiful to play i imagine no 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 they were amazing to play yeah. the pink resurrection strat had the thinnest neck ever 
Oh. They had a really slim neck Rosewood fretboard. Yeah. Um, sounded great. The 59 st- Strat sounded fantastic. Yeah. The 59 Les Paul was, you couldn't tell whether it was a Les Paul or a Strat. <laughs> it was so kind of vibrant. Really? Unbelievable to play. The Blood Red one was super heavy, the Les Paul, but it was set up for a slide, so it had heavy gauge strings on it. Right. Yeah. I mean, the other pedals you had, you got his chorus pedal and things like that, and that's how you've been able to... Well, you can hear yeah, well, I inherited two electro harmonics uh, flanges, electric mistresses. Oh, the electric mistresses. Yeah, is that the one with the yeah. green writing on it? It's, it's uh, a silver, isn't it? With like, is it black? I think it's silver and black. There's newer versions, aren't there? Yeah. No, it's silver and black. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Silver and black. I had two units I inherited. I gave one to Martine Rock, you know, Andy Rock's daughter for a birthday. Oh, right. Meant uh, a decade ago as a birthday present. Oh, wow. Um, and the other one. Um, somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere, yeah. I'm but it sure. was kind of where you know that change into second coming and looking for different uh, effects units that could reproduce you know those kind of sounds and things like that. Yeah. Uh, whereas the, originally, different songs call for different guitars. You know, for me personally. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Staying on the effects thing. I mean, um, recently you spoke on um, Instagram about the the DL fours. You? you got the new version. Yeah, which is right here nice that's the brand new mark two mark two dl4 yeah yeah you find it and uh, the beauty oh it's lovely i mean it's even got look at the inputs on it now you've got microphone input on it oh, you've got wow. midi sockets on it stereo in and out as per usual and then you've got usb c as oh, well proper upgrade and you've got a gain control for the uh, mic input as well oh wow yeah and um it's got all the new stuff but you can load up the legacy stuff if you still want to use the original sounds yeah uh they're kind of listed you can see it's in green or white oh yeah yeah you switch between them nice and it's very light compared to the older unit which uh, the i've got here but it's at the back here <laughs> <laughs> nice cool so yeah and you also had um the other interesting guitar you've got um one, one of them <laughs> is uh, that uh the Jaguar, the see-through Jaguar, the sort of greeny coloured one. Uh, yeah, the green. Yeah, Ian Brown. I call it the green Manalishi. <laughs> <laughs> a light up uh, dot inlays, isn't it? Uh, this is the babe. Look at that. This is it. Yep. So when do you have that made? Then you must have that made for for you, especially. No, it was a very cheap guitar. All oh, right. Called Legend. <laughs> ah. And what you can see within the plastic, the acrylic, is my sweat <laughs> has bonded with the plastic for some reason. I think it comes off with a chemical or something. I can't remember what you use, and oh. it will clean it up. But the neck, as you know, has those um, built-in <laughs> green LED lights, which yeah. you can see there, I hope. Yeah. That is cool. Yeah. <laughs> is, that on uh, the, uh, also- is that on Unfinished, yes. unfinished Monkey Business? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, it was more of a live tour guitar. It wasn't on the recordings as much. Right. Um, but this, I had modified so much. It has a, a drop D, as you can see here, oh. on the tuning peg. Oh, wow. There you go. Can you see that? Yeah. Never seen one of those before. Yeah. Also, it has a coil tap um, here. Oh, right. Going to single so, there. Yeah. Um, and because it has these green Path Pros, those are original Damasio Path Pros that you find on like Jen, Steve Vai guitars and things yeah, like that. Yeah. But it's uh, Damasio's, you know, um, version of the Path Pro. Yeah. I mean, they're very old company, so, you know, they've got a lot of history of their own yeah. in terms of pickups. And then Graftech saddles. Um, yeah. And the, and the nuts as well, so. After that, yeah, nice. Whoop. <laughs> so, I mean, just after after you left the roses, obviously that all sort of imploded, didn't it? And then you started off with it. You were recording unfinished monkey business at home, weren't you? On tape. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, all that album was basically bedroom recordings, um, with the exception of the third coming recordings, which were, you know, uh, tunes. Uh, Nana and uh, Black Sheep and 
ice cold cube and yeah. those kind of getting you know, high time was it? Uh, high times yeah, yeah not getting high. um so those kind of tunes you know they uh, they weren't done in the studio we literally took them off cassette tapes and put them into the recording yeah. and uh because i had the a cassette tape with a version we couldn't get hold of the masters yeah. due to the politics and uh ian took my copy and then we stuck now now on the recordings ice cold i revamped ice cold cube you know i revamped all the music and wrote new parts um which yeah because it sounds different for the, the when you play your reading it's pretty oh much different yeah yeah, yeah, different, yeah much different i mean i did a version which i liked which is almost like a beatles kind of you know the uh, one of the guys beatles playing you know the um were it or something like that you know oh, down yeah. down 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 down, 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 down. <laughs> very kind of <laughs> yeah. uh and i thought as a riff and i put a um, you know rotary speaker on it from using ketna rotosphere and i i just liked um that version of it and we passed the bass between us i played the bass on a lot of the parts and then ian dropped some bass lines in the bridges which is but it was a great contrast between the two different styles of you yeah. know what the go-to notes and things like that yeah. yeah that's a great album that um and uh it can't cheeky see... album cheeky cheeky <laughs> cheeky little album um yeah yeah that's it can't see me um i noticed the bass line from that that was lifted from like an original version of breaking in the heaven had that bass line did you well know, i mean that's money that's money playing the bass play so... <laughs> was it like yeah, a... he's... <laughs> Wait, let, let's just lift that because we've already written it type you know i don't know yeah i don't know it because sounds cool i mean i don't blame him at all because it's brilliant it wasn't done in house we didn't do those tracks in house they were kind of pre-recorded stuff that we said we need haven't got enough material to fill out the album so that but the bulk of it which was done between myself and ian uh, in our individual bedrooms or at his house if i'd come around with a part or something and we shape something up yeah. or we just record it there you know once so i got my head around the equipment that he had which he wasn't too familiar with uh so i did all the tech part of it you know yeah um like loops and stuff but that track yeah i mean that was something that was recorded before and manny had done through uh i mean i did a track uh with rennie as well in terms of using drum loops from rennie's playing from previous recordings so yeah i oh, do you went uh, around his house and met him didn't you is that right that's right yeah i had a jam at his house yeah, yeah. he yeah. says nonchalantly <laughs> no it's cool that, that you well met him. i mean i i rate rennie as a great drummer but I've played with great drummers, you know, yeah, from yeah. the great hi historic kind of players like not Steve Gadd, but uh, Billy Cobham, you know, and then I worked with Clem Burke from Blondie, you know, and I've worked with, you know, in bands and then yeah. worked with some fantastic kind of technicians like Marco Miniman, um, who did the Dream Theater audition and um, Gavin Harrison and, uh, you know, from Porcupine Tree and um and then with mike joyce from the smiths so i'm absolutely spoiled when it comes to yeah, drummers yeah, yeah. you know it's um, in general and, and really. donald johnson and donald johnson from acr and you know it's an endless list of great drummers that i've worked with yeah uh or played with so i'm not phased really in that respect no, but no. i do understand the character of drummers what greatness they have in terms of their individuality i really love that you know and that's what the enjoyment factor I get. Yeah. I mean, technically, you know, I play with guys like Dalby Singer, then who's an, a, a tabla player, and he's the most formidable percussionist and mathematician of drums you will ever meet in your life. He will frighten you to death. <laughs> and you know, so I'm not phased. If after you've worked with Indian tabla players, I swear it it doesn't worry yeah. me about drummers. But I love the, these guys that I've worked with. They're the they're the the guys, you know. As far as I'm concerned, yeah, Inder Indigo, Goldfinger and Inder, yeah. yeah, and what a genius musician he is, you know, creative uh, and multi kind of instrumentalist, uh, so integral, you know, in the band. Uh, I'm, I really wish he was on the recordings of the Unfinished Monkey Business. Yeah, um, I mean, he would have contributed so much, but he has done for all the Ian Brown albums. Yeah, has, yeah. has done some fantastic play. Not to mention, he's been there for every single Ian Brown show. You know, yeah, yeah, that's saying something. It brings yeah. a lot, doesn't he? He's, yeah, he's a great player. Yeah, the angle I had there was that you met him uh, through obviously, and 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 like you said, he did some break beats, didn't he? That you used, you used some break beats. Yeah. from yeah, that's what's funny about it first. Yeah, yeah, and um, I've got a track called "Mommy's Boy" on my album "The Hot Alongside," but yeah. I'm releasing these tracks now, yeah. uh, uploading them to my Spotify and my 
you know, all my the usual digital outlets, but yeah. uh, you know, Aziz Ibrahim music. Uh, and this one track, uh, Mummy's Boy, is Rennie's drumming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, break beats I created from uh, a, a jam session that he was when they the roses were in the studio. Oh, it's from then. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. It's one of those kind of things where you go, how come this was never released? You know, Paul Weller's on it. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, um, Mike Joyce, Sandy Rock, um, Steve White, um, yeah. Indy Goldfinger, uh, Denise Johnson, um, who else? Rennie, uh, Manny. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. how would an album like that ever be released? And yeah. I, what I found is that now is the time for me to upload these tracks and make them available. If you want to, I, I, I think um, one of the songs I, I did want to show you, yeah. um, it was interesting to talk about, is Waterfall. So I, I basically play that on the neck pickup, um, just on this guitar. I uh, tend to pick the pickups according to the kind of guitar it is. So a semi-acoustic, this is a hollow body, but it's not a semi-acoustic. Mm. Uh, would have a different tone on the middle pickups or the or the brightness of the, the neck. And here's another little trick. I throw this sample in at the beginning of the tune. <laughs> that's a cool sound so i throw that little sample in but the main part of the stand, uh, sound if you listen to the recording doesn't start with the roll tree it starts with the roll tree off <laughs> Kaplan on the fourth fret. I mean, I don't know if you remember at the days of uh, interviews around 96, 97, some of my performance at Reading, everybody was asking me, how did you play Waterfall without a capo? <laughs> because I didn't know no. that John was using a capo. I hadn't seen any videos, hadn't seen the band live, and I can't tell you. So I learned to play it on as fretted notes. Yeah. Um, I learned Waterfall. Well, I learned all the songs like that without capos all the chords and everything arranged for open playing, no capo. But now, obviously, yeah, yeah. with the internet, I go, oh, it made my life easy, <laughs> put a capo on. Yeah. Yeah. So you can hear the type of delay. Yeah. Then what I'm doing is, when um, we go around the cycle of it, And that's when I switch the road tree in. I mean, that's the main tone for me, you know, that yeah. um, you kind of understand the the what the tube scream is doing and the chorus pedal is doing because the chorus pedal is, if you look at my chorus pedal, the dial is very low. Yeah. It's on a very low speed. Take off the uh, rotary. Yeah. <laughs> It's quite a difference, doesn't it? The wrong tree. Absolutely, yeah. So those those working together, like you say, the chorus on yeah on that low setting. Now this part here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is where, if you listen. You can hear the sound of square waveform fuzz. That's a fuzz face. Yeah. You can tell by that nature of the way that the. If I switch in the fuzz. Find a sweet spot. And 
don't forget the vibrato on that note. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a little bit too dirty, but it's hard to control a fuzz face. You know, you've got to find a sweet spot very quickly, unless yeah. the pickups. Uh, I mean, this is one thing. This is a really technical thing, but a lot of guitarists have their volume control modified, as in um, they have capacitance within their change. They have a tr what's called a treble bleed, and it retains the brightness of the guitar when you knock the volume control down. Now. Right. That's not something you would want to use with a fuzz face, not like this, no. because it's a very bright uh, fuzz face. And when you drop the volume down, it'll be really bright. Yeah. So you would just leave it as it is without that treble bleed cap mod. Yeah. You just want a guitar that goes a little bit dull yeah. when the volumes roll back. And then when you roll it back, the fuzz face comes to the correct kind of brightness yeah. then slightly okay. duller than it normally is so it's kind of you want the opposite to the way that your guitar is set yeah, up yeah, yeah, exactly. the guitar set up with the treble bleed cap you want a, a fuzz face that darkens when it's rolled off um but if you it's the opposite if it's a bright fuzz face then when you roll it back you can darken it by yeah. not modifying the treble bleed do you get what i mean yeah, yeah and then a, find that sweet spot you do the opposite yeah, yeah. yeah to balance the effects of the yeah. fuzz that's why this Benson fuzz is so great. You know, you can set the volume position on the actual pedal itself without yeah. having to roll it. That's so all you do is click it on, click yeah. it off. Yeah. Uh, whereas with the fuzz face, you got to roll the volume back to get the different tonalities yeah. of the fuzz of the you know original. Fuzz oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. The other factor is um, so you can hear that kind of it's almost papery, but yeah. the tube screamer pushes out the mids of it. That's why you can hear it better. I mean, it's a nice sound without a tube screamer. I mean, that's a real fuss for me. <laughs> that's what they sound like. Yeah, yeah. But in a band context, they get lost, you know, they, because of the scoop kind of yeah. mids to it. And that's why the tube screamer is so good. <laughs> It pushes the mids out, yeah. and you get that. There you go, that's better. Now this, my secret weapon for the Elise's part that Kreza would push in, is and why I have my rig in stereo is because the H9 is in stereo and I flick to the next preset, which is a stereo tap delay. Oh, right. If you've got a stereo setup, you'll hear the delay pan. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I use for. That's perfect, isn't it, for that sound? Well, I, I mean, I'm not hearing it from your end, but I hope it's coming across in that way that yeah, yeah. you can hear the difference in what fuzz distortion overdrive is about. Yeah. It's not as simple as just putting any old yeah. overdrive pedal. Yes, of course, you'll feel good about it, but listen to the recording and listen to the difference of what a fuzz face actually does. Yeah. And that was, they were his tools, a fuzz face, a, a tube screamer, you know, and, yeah. and the amps, yeah, the way he was using his amps, yeah. you know? very old school ways but they create such a unique sound yeah. but it really shows you the beauty of what um, these two transistor you know square waveform <laughs> distortion boxes do you know? yeah, yeah. these units here they're amazing <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, 
but yeah, I mean, from your description with the, you know, pu pushing the mids from the um, the tube screen, uh, bringing out the the fuzz face, you know, even if you couldn't hear it, you, you know, and you went and play off and and played around with those settings, just hearing that information that's that's great information Makes sense to have. Maybe. Yeah, it's great because you know when people are learning guitar and they want to sound like the Stone Roses, you know, it doesn't say that in the book, does it? <laughs> you know, these are the, <laughs> but these are no. important bits for the no, sound, aren't they? You know, and not well, just I mean, the Stone Roses, obviously. Yeah, again. Sorry, uh, John. No, okay. uh, just looking at something like, you know, Made of Stone, for instance, and I'm capoing on the second fret for that. Yeah. Um, you know. Made of Stone. So you, a lot of people play this in different ways, but the, I think the main thing is to have the G string open for the, for the chords when you go... still on the fuzz actually so let me just get rid of that. turn the volume back up on the guitar so you get more of that kind of cleaner tone you're getting this kind of Is just a D minor shape. Yeah. And I like to play the next part up because it should be the bass guitarist that's doing the melody part and you play the and then go. play the chords and bar chords. Now this part, there's overdub guitar parts and one guitar is keeping the high note going. the kind of yeah. things because that was quite overdubbed and I yeah. thought how do I play that you know the at the same time as playing the root note change of at the end yeah, yeah. we're still going to play
flange is that? It's the old boss flanger. Yeah, that's the, I thought it was. <laughs> well, this is the BF3. Now, it was a BF2 that I, I inherited from the Roses, but ah. I've been using this BF3 just because I find that I'm, um, I, I like messing with the settings of the high flange and the, and the original flange to get the sweep. Because these boss flanges, I mean, they're not as expensive as some of these fancy, you know, custom mm. flanges you can buy these days, but they, they do that sound, they do that sweep. Yeah. Just um, and this sits in stereo at the end of all my uh, effects, and then it feeds the delay unit in stereo. Ah. So it's just that when I'm playing live, the flanging goes across the speakers then. Yeah. And as a tonal experience for the audience, not only do you get the sweep, but you get the stereo effect yeah. of it as well. Oh, uh, that's why I run it in stereo. Cool. Very nice. <laughs> Beautiful unit, you know. Yeah, I love yeah. that kind of. Uh, um, I mean, it's probably that kind of. Which only really happens halfway through that tune. This is the one. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Ibanez chorus is really the... Yeah. I've got um, a plate reverb on the H9 here, um, giving a really nice dark kind of reverb. Another a solo, you, the, it's more Ian Brown solo stuff, um, My Star, the solo in My Star, that's such, got such a cool sound in it. It's kind of got this, you know, when I think about it, it's almost got like a wobbly <laughs> sound, isn't it? It's like, well, I mean, it's hard to reproduce because I, I did that kind of Rose's technique of you know the overdubs and creating kind of unique sounds like I did for corpses in the mouths where I yeah. I overdubbed uh, twelve string Rickenbacker yeah. beautiful V sixty four you know George Harrison model twelve string Ricky yeah. um, with a acoustic guitar um, and within the, on that I think I used the fifty nine Les Paul uh, that's why it sounds so damn good uh -huh. yeah. And um, the riff, I mean, I had the whole guitar a whole tone down, like all the guitars were a whole tone down during yeah. Unfinished Monkey Business. Oh, okay. And it was, well, the riff itself. Tap the solo really, it's a kind of just a. I'll put the fuzz on to be able to make it kick out a bit more. Right. Which I'm just it. tapping the octaves of the notes. Ah, that's the sound. Just a tapped, yeah, that's harmonic the tap of Yeah, that's what octave. I was after, I think. The tapping, that's what it is. But because it's kind of low down, it just sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I'm basically following the movement. Because my, my left hand's getting stronger now, but it was... Uh... Yeah. 
using those notes, which would probably fall into a major scale, you know, mix a living or something like that. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, even though I'm playing in A, the, it was a whole tone down, so it's actually in G. Yeah. Ah, okay, whole tone down. And then, I guess the uh, corpse is quite a different uh, sound, doesn't it? You know, what was amazing. Yeah. I, I just remember you know, when, when that came out, you know. I mean, again, that's, um, you know. Some nice chords, so yeah. you've got this kind of A minor shape. Put the cap on the fifth, put the guitars a whole tone down, so it's yeah. C minor I'm playing. And I'm just starting with that A minor shape, really. Yeah. Um, and then it goes to, which is a G, an F with an open E, and an open, the G string's open. part of it is this kind of A minor shape to an E major. Yeah. So you keep that going and then underneath it was an acoustic guitar kind of going. C, D, and one and two. <laughs> and then the hardest part for me was because I constructed it after the chorus was written in the studio when we went down to Chiswick Reach and he sang this, she's your corpse is in the mouth, blah, 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 blah. And I needed a melody, so I locked myself in this cupboard <laughs> with a four track four studio with the track so far and wrote this. That little solo. I love, yeah, behind. see, I love oh, that because cool. were you playing on that like that? Um, I was it up in the on the ninth fret or something? You go boom, you know that bass note that comes in is unexpected and it just colours so much of that song. It's, it's brilliant. <laughs> And then obviously the bass line plays a really integral part, but yeah. I played the bass on it as well, and oh, I programmed yeah. the drums. So you said um, the whole track. Ian was um, he had a. He was singing the, the the melody for that. Is that a side with him? Was just that idea of she's got courses in them? He wrote, he wrote the lyrics. Yeah, he wrote that melody. And, and then you came um, up with two my chords. Oh, okay. And then and then he put his harmonica on top. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I basically came to him with a track, a finished track of drums, bass guitar, guitars, but not the melody guitars for the chorus because right. that came after he wrote his vocals. Yeah. yeah. Great it's such a great vocal, yeah, great lyrics, and I just I responded. I said it really needs something special to respond to those vocals, yeah, so yeah. I wrote that. <laughs> and I uh, double tracked it with a twelve string guitar, with um, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and then I used the tremolo from a, a cork Pandora. It's very cheap. Um, multi effects unit. I've still got it here somewhere. Oh, yeah, the original. Yeah. Well, that part of obviously uh, had the colours it so well as well. So you yeah, <laughs> did a great job on that because, yeah, just great, just a great uh, track, really, isn't it? But so. But, that... I mean, I, yeah, I wrote, you know, it's different. It's like we've gone through Rose's tunes and I didn't write those. Yeah. 
but it was great uh, kind of for me research to analyze them for playing live yeah but when you play something that you wrote yeah. it's completely different you know the way that you approach something yeah. the sounds you use it's like i don't have the sounds set up for my own songs you know <laughs> and it's that strange that yeah. i don't have the i can't reproduce it in that way off the album mm. um yeah i was going to say i mean uh, coming out of the races that must have been like great to start with it and get on those tracks you know write those like say around his house or around your house and be able to just express yourself now yeah. and not not copy I mean, someone else or their sounds even though you you did like you know, there's great sounds to copy but you know you want to do your own thing so of course i mean that was the thing about the ian brown solo era i was kind of relieved that the roses had ended because it meant that coming to the ian brown solo stuff he gave me free reign yeah. to write you know, because he wasn't going to write the, all those chords and things and whatnot, no. you know. So he gave me that opportunity to step up, which I, I'm not sure I would have got in the Roses, you no. know, because it was a... Anyway, I mean, when I'm going into the politics of it, I was new. I was the latest member. And yeah. How much say did I have? I, you know, I wasn't confident about, you know, yeah. saying my piece at that time. But well, there's so much pressure during on Ian's them. era, it yeah. was so laid back. We didn't have a record deal. The band had ended. We were just chilling at Ian's place mostly, yeah. you know, in Lim and Pepper Street. And um, and he gave me that confidence to uh, write. You know, he always, Ian has never put me down musically. He's always uh, spoken highly of my playing and said, you know, you can tell by his quotes, you know, this guy should be in a, <laughs> living, you know, in a mansion with a guitar saved swimming pool, but yeah. he's not in it for the money. You know, this yeah. kind of thing Ian talks about. And I like... And, I, and, you know, it's such a beautiful compliment, but he's always um, backs me up, you know, and that's mm. why I respect him in that way, you know, because ups or downs, we've had our ups and downs, but I never disrespect that that he's shown me, yeah. um, which has always given me the confidence to perform. And, you know, like I hooked up with Paul Weller after that, and that's what gave me the confidence to write for Paul or to yeah. collaborate with him, you know, because of the... Um, confidence that Ian gave me yeah, you know, yeah. to step up and Mike Joyce and Andy Rock from the Smiths when I worked with them on my solo album and being in the same band you know uh, called Aziz yeah <laughs> they gave me that confidence yeah yeah it was great that happened I mean I was, I was you know we sort of joked about it earlier but it's a little bit of a poison challenge you know stepping in for John and all that pressure like you said the Roses had that all that pressure anyway you know, coming out of second coming after like you say you know the loved album the first album but it would, yeah. I mean, if I'm honest, you know, back back in the nineties, when uh, there's a new replaces replacement guitarist for John, you know, you know, for me that was like, yeah, good luck, you know. And I, I, like, I my mind <laughs> was off. My, my my mind was off to you, mate. You couldn't win. But no, but I, no I, you way. know, you know, my mate, he, he went to Reading, and he said it was a great time. He was jump around in the crowd, um, and then and then the press slated it, and I only got the second hand thing from him. But he had a great time. So mm -hmm. you know, that's I mean, how that was. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, it's difference of opinion. Uh, the people's opinions is not everybody's opinion. You get some people who've got the same opinions, but they're just opinions. At the end of the day, of how they felt, what their opinion was of the event, um, an honest opinion. So I'm not knocking it. Um, and maybe I might knock the press and the media because they had an agenda and they want to sell copies and they want readers. But uh, honest opinions, yeah, there were good ones and bad ones, but they're not all the same, there yeah. are differences. And it, from the stage perspective, I'm sober as a judge always, I don't forget anything. Mm -hmm. And that, people around the edges always leave, they're always up to the bar, they're always going off somewhere or go and see something else or whatever. Yeah. But that place was full from beginning to end, so yeah. if they were leaving in droves, it would have been empty at the end, and it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, well, he said that wasn't true as well, so... But musically, if you talk music, you give me free reigns, I'll go to town on yeah. an album. If you really let me go to town. I mean, Ian gave me a lot of freedom, but not the freedom that I really want right now. Right. You know, what I can produce. If I was to collaborate with a vocalist now, a singer, songwriter, it would be a heck of an album. The input from what I've learned from being in the Roses, what I've learned from working with some of the greats of the United Kingdom, and globally, what I've learned from working with instrumentation from Africa and South Asia and Middle East and so forth, and yeah. working with different art forms. I'm an, I'm really hungry at the moment yeah. to write and play and perform and work and collaborate with people because I believe in the new age, the revolution of music and the industry and the changes that have come about and the way that. Um, you know, we've got more control over um, making music. We've got to learn some 
promotion and advertising and marketing skill sets and learn about content creation and how algorithms work. I get that, mm. you know, uh, it's a turn off for some, but for me, it's a challenge. Yeah. I'm loving the tools. I'm loving the analytics, being able to work out what works, what doesn't, when's the best time, what's the <laughs> demographic, where, what's, what country, you know, it's kind of really interesting times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I, for one, I'm looking forward to anything that you, you come up with, uh, Ziz, because it's always really interesting. Oh, cheers, it's cheers, always you. interesting music that you come up with. So, and like I say, you know, coming out the roses, you, you, they're now able to start with that and it'll be, it'll be uh, really looking forward to hearing some more. Definitely. Well, I mean, people like yourself, John, and, uh, you know, James Hargrove, you, you're giving me a voice. That's what I didn't have in 96. I didn't have a voice apart from what the NME or Radio 1 labelled me as, you know, it was part of their agenda to say, oh, he said this about John, and he was really, you know, they said it, you know, I did say things, and it was in a context, of the arrogance of the context, you know, I was flying high as a kite, you know, at that time, as not literally, but, yeah. you know, to be in the roses. Yeah. I was like, can anyone imagine what that's like? Uh, and I was talking big, just like the band, and the band made me feel that way. Yeah. And then afterwards, you realize the things you've said are like so out of order. But it's the arrogance of it, the same yeah. thing that when you walk around your council estate and talking big, you know, what are you looking at? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, but to be judged based upon that, I mean, that was my, um, and I didn't have a voice to be able to retaliate. But now, you know, we're able to talk about these things on, uh, YouTube and, uh, you know, Facebook or wherever social media and people can get better insights into the person, my personality, your personality, um, talk about the making of things. And because I believe, you know, the King is dead, long live the King. And, yeah. you know, we, uh, we can talk about these things now. You no, know, we're not looking for record deals here. Right. We've already got our own record deals, our own record companies. We can do what the yeah, hell yeah, we yeah. want. It's great. Well, we want, you don't need it? to buy enemy. <laughs> no, exactly. It's a lot freer time, isn't it? You know, and you get far more in-depth information. You come on your show, and you're getting a lot of in-depth information. Yeah, you know, and <laughs> you can cross-reference as well with the other guys who are doing stuff. You know, girls who are doing stuff uh, yeah. uh, on a similar vein, and you get a very broad kind of knowledge. And when you cross-reference, you can find truths in there. You know, um, and you, you know, what sits well with you, and you start to go, "No, this is right," because, you know you've lots of different reference points yeah. and they meet somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been yeah. absolutely fascinating uh, as is to, to talk to you about this. And, uh, yeah. And what you play. It's been a pleasure, John. Yeah. Going through some of these tunes, you know, I would have loved to have gone through some of the others. Um, uh, but another time, maybe you know. another time, maybe <laughs> grab your attention for well, yeah. two, another two hours. Too many songs, too many good songs to <laughs> oh, kind of go to. I mean, I, I love things like, you know, because people love to play, you know, uh, this is, this is what I do for 10 story. I have this, I created this organ sample on a drum. Yeah. knock it down a little and then i put the um actually I put the strat on for this cool so this is like a you know 70s strat nice. it is a 70s you know it's got that big you know. headstock the one thing i'm not sure about is the recording of 10 story love song um but i went with a strat just because when i perform live it works with a fuzz face so well so there's the, you know, beautiful clean Stratocaster. Switch on the fuzz face. You get this beautiful kind of clarity, but overdrive. Mine has a uh, a kill switch installed. Oh yes. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, we can see it now. Yeah. Yeah. So you can cut the tone out. Nice. It's right under my fingers there. Knock back the volume. Cleans up. Oh, sounds nice. So it's ideal for that kind of song, you know, where you're going. 
Well, actually, let's get the right tone. I did set it up. There you go. I think uh, string gauges matter. Have you got tens on it? String gauges uh, on a strap because of the scale length yeah. to a Gibson. I use uh, nine thou strings; they're quite light. Oh, right. Whereas on a Les Paul, I'll use tens. Right. On a Gretsch, I'll use tens, maybe even elevens. Yeah. I mean, it's a typical one where you can use the octaver. Yeah. You know, you can use this. Uh, Mosaic, for instance. I always start playing harmonic minor for some reason. <laughs> Here's the interesting part. I love playing the chords around the changes yeah. within the chorus. It's so beautiful, the change of it. Descending chords with the root changes. Yes. Yeah. Descending line, I love leaving the the G string open so you get this kind of accompanied. You get quite a, yeah. with the reverb, you get nice. Yeah. And it really fills out live, you know, fills the sound out without having to play any chords. And then the descending part of that. <laughs> See, before I used to play it off the recordings, John used to play it kind of low. So you. He played in that kind of range. Oh. But it didn't make sense to me. I, I kind of wanted to play the root note and have the melody on the high string. You get a nice kind of yeah. You see I made the high note sing and last over the chord with the reverb. Ah yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a great it's tune, a nice one to end on. Yeah, yeah, it's a really nice tune that. 
I think it's really underrated, but maybe it's great, great song, great yeah. song, great arrangements, great guitar parts, bass line, drums, everything about it. Yeah. Beautiful song. Yeah. Well yeah. sung by Ian. Definitely parts of that album massively underrated, I think, but they couldn't have won anyway, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The expectation I mean, and everyone wanted the first album. But yeah. oh, no, it's so, been brilliant. As is. Uh, thanks for sharing that. It's been uh, massively interesting and an education as well. So <laughs> Uh, oh, cheers, buddy. Nice to be on. Uh, even talking to you, man, I have a love for this too. So yeah. to be sat here talking with you about these yeah. things that we love and other people probably watching Do have days. a love for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What a great time instead of watching daytime, you know, yeah. <laughs> BBC and Granada yeah. Channel. Turn that rubbish shit. off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this stuff. Yeah. What's better than guitars? Roses tunes, Ian Brown songs, whatever, guitars and more guitars. <laughs> For me, nothing. <laughs> this has been absolutely dream come true. Exactly. Yeah. John, as you said, we need to end it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thanks very much for, thanks for, having for us. coming on. Thanks for listening. Um, Cheers. Yeah. Cheers, mate. <laughs>